Good morning, Beverly Hills Church family. We want to welcome you to this beautiful Sunday morning here. Uh, we are excited to be here to worship with you. Uh, let us go ahead and open up with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are with us and that we can worship you in song and praise. We pray that your name would be honored and glorified in the singing that we do and in the preaching of the word. And it is in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. I have just a few announcements for you this morning. Uh, the first is I would like to say thank you for your continued to support us here. Uh, the ministry is ever going and is continually going. Even if you don't see it, we are still moving and we are still preaching and teaching. And we want to say thank you uh, for your continued support of the ministry here at Beverly Hills. Uh, also, uh, if you have any prayer requests, please feel free to send those in. Uh, please leave a comment, leave a message. You can call the church, you can email the church, you can call or email me, uh, and you can even text message me. Uh, if there's any way that we can pray for you, uh, we would love to do so. And, and also, I'm very excited tonight to tell you that we will have a praise and worship set uh, with our praise band here. Uh, they've done a wonderful job, and we're excited to, to have them bring a worship time tonight. So if you will tune in tonight, that will be uh, at 6 p.m., and we will have uh, some wonderful music by our praise band. At this time, let us have some music uh, by Miss Charity Short. Well, good morning. We're glad that you joined us, and we are going to start off with the hymn and the sweet by and by. John 14, 2 says, I am going away to prepare a place for you. We think about our eternal security there and our sweet by and by. take our eyes off the master because he knows things that we don't know and we need to make sure that we're always turning our eyes toward Jesus no matter what the circumstance no matter what the day no matter if we're in the valley or on the on the mountaintop turning our eyes to Jesus keeping focus on the master keeps us safe and in his arms
you'll turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 14. Psalm 14, and we will begin in verse 1. I want to say welcome uh, to all of those who are tuning in today, uh, to our guests and to our Beverly Hills Church family. Psalm 14, beginning in verse 1. My question for you this morning is this. Have you ever had to save yourself? Have you ever had to save yourself? Now, uh, I remember uh, when I was uh, first married, uh, my wife and I went on a cruise for our honeymoon. And it was a Disney cruise. And the first thing we did after we boarded the ship and they, uh, before they took off, they called everybody on deck, everybody that was in, in the boat to the crew and the guests. And they explained to us how we are to put on the life vest. They showed us where they were at, uh, told us how to get onto the exit boats in case something was to happen, and, and how we could help to save ourselves. Now, as I'm standing around in a dining room full of many people wearing a life vest, looking at my newly married wife, the only thought that goes through my mind is, here we go, this is how Titanic started. I could not get out of my mind the thought that I am going to have to save myself, and if not only myself, but my wife, but uh, whoever was around us, women and children and all those alike, standing here with a life vest around my neck, and I'm thinking, this is it, this is how the Titanic sank. Now, thankfully, we did not sink. We didn't have any issues, and we made it back to port in a couple of days, and everything was okay. But I've never... Uh, been in my life at the point where I've had to save myself. I have been in an accident as a child and had to be rescued by the fire department. And, and I have seen others who needed to be rescued. But when it comes to rescuing ourselves, uh, we may have a chance if we are conscious and able, and then there may be times that we are not. When we look at the spiritual man, the spiritual woman, the spiritual that is who we are outside of this flesh and body. We are a deprived, depraved humankind. We cannot, in our depravity, save ourselves. There is nothing that we can do to save us for eternal damnation. We, in our depravity, are doomed. I want to take a look at Psalm 14 and how David brings this to light. And how David explains to us that in our depravity, that in our own humanity, that we do not seek, that we do not look towards God. Uh, I want to take a look at today the depravity of mankind. Psalm 1, beginning in verse 1, David sings uh, to the choir master of David, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Now, I could preach an entire message just on these few words. This first opening verse here in Psalm 14 speaks quite loud in the spirituality of mankind. The fool says in his heart that there is no God. The word here in the Hebrew fool uh, does not mean in ignorance. There is a difference between being ignorant and being dumb. Uh, when we talk about the word ignorant, we talk about not knowing. Paul in his epistles talk about how he would uh, have us not to be ignorant brothers, meaning he would not have us to be uninformed. When you don't know something, then you just don't know. But here what David explains is that it isn't that there's a lack of knowing, but that it is that you know and yet you choose not to believe. The word here means foolish stupid, dumb, and even in the English word asinine, utterly foolish comes to mind. The, the complete dummy, as we would say, the fool says in his heart that there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. Here David echoes the words that were uh, mentioned many, many, many years later that Paul would echo David and saying that there is no one righteous, no, not one, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Here David says that they're corrupt. 
They are, they are abominable. They do horrible deeds. There is none that is good. Man in his deprived nature will not believe in God. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. What David is explaining is completely and utterly foolish. That there is way too many reasons to believe in God. When we look at the world around us, whether it is in the life of a, of a child that you have, whether it is in looking at nature outside, seeing the clouds go by, feeling the breeze that blows on us, seeing the trees grow, or whether it is the spark of new life and seeing a child being conceived, uh, whether it is how the body functions and how the, the respiratory and the blood flows, whatever it may be, Whatever you may see, there is cause for us to see that there is something greater than us. Our world, the physical world around us, screams that there is a divine creator. If you look at space and how the world spins, uh, I was having a science lesson with my daughter uh, a couple of days ago, and we were talking about how gravity works. And we were talking about how the earth sits at a tilt. And as the earth spins, if it was to slow down by one mile per hour, that gravity would take over and would pull everybody to the center, killing everybody. But if the world was to speed up by one mile per hour, that we would be flown off of the earth in a great speed because God has finally tuned this world. This world beckons that there is a creator. You don't have to be one of the most intelligent people in the world. You don't have to have an IQ over 300 to look about and to see that God is real. Only the utter foolish say in their heart that there is no God. That is man in his depraved nature. Man in depravity will say that there is no God. He will not believe in God. And why? It's because their mind is corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. Here, David equates those who do these wicked things, who, who do not believe in God, to understanding that there is no one who does good. Now, what I want you to first understand is that there are people who do good deeds. There are good Samaritans. Don't hear me say that there isn't. There are many humanitarians around the world who are doing wonderful things. But if we do anything... Outside of the work and love of Christ, it becomes self-centered. It becomes something that we do for ourselves. We may not want to admit to it. There may be a many a great humanitarian who would never say that. They may say, oh, it's for a greater cause. But that cause is not the ultimate cause. And the ultimate cause is God because God causes all things. When we do everything outside of God, we do it in vain. Why? Because there is none who's good. There are those who don't believe in God. Man in his depravity will not believe in God. Man also in his depravity will not seek after God. If you do not believe in God, then you will not seek after God. The Lord looks down from heaven on his children of man to see if there are any who understand who seek after God. Man in his sinful nature will not seek after a divine God. Here David says that the Lord looks down from heaven on his children of man. Here he is looking down and he is continually looking down at his children. He is looking at all of those who are on earth. And you here on earth fall into one of two categories. You are either a child of the king or you are not a child of the king. You are in righteousness or you are out of righteousness. You are either saved or you are unsaved, you are heaven bound, or you are condemned. That is how it is. Your name is either written in the Lamb's book of life and you are in the covenant of God, or you are on the outside of the covenant looking in and you are out of righteousness. God looks down and he knows who his children are. That is all that matters in this world. There are great things that we can accomplish. There are great humanitarian things that we can do. Reaching out and feeding starving children. I'm not saying that that's not bad. 
uh, reaching out and helping the needy and poor. I'm not saying that that's bad. I'm saying those are good things. But in ultimate reality, all that matters is your relationship with Jesus Christ. Either you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior or you do not. God will know as he looks down. Here we talk about God being omniscient. And the word means that God is all-knowing. God knows his children in and out. He knows the number of hairs on their head. He knows his children. God knows if you are a true believer or you are not. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. He is continually looking after his children. And he's continually looking out, looking for those to call upon him. Uh, calling upon when their eyes are open and their ears uh, are open and their heart is softened as God reaches down to you first. Man in his depravity does not believe in God and man in his depravity will not seek after God. He will not look to God. Even the greatest of men are still vile in their hearts. Why? Because they are a corrupt sin nature. Only those who God has touched can reach to Him. You can't save yourself. Only God can save us. Only the defining work of Jesus on the cross can bring salvation. I've had it many a times where people will say, How many people have you saved? How many people have you saved? I have saved no one. No pastor on this earth has ever saved anybody. And said, I have led them to the Lord. I have directed them. I plant the seed, but God does the growing. God does the saving work. Uh, you can't uh, throw a, a corpse, a life preserver, and expect him to save himself. That's not how it works. Man in his depravity does not seek after God. Not only man in his depravity does not believe in God, nor does he seek after God, but man in his depravity will not serve God. David continues to write in verse 3, They have all turned aside together. They have become corrupt. Here he reiterates the words that he has spoken in verse 1, that they've all turned away. Either you turn to God or you turn away from God. This pandemic that is going on right now will do one of two things. It will turn you to faith in God, seeing that he is still in control, or it will turn you away. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Man in his deprived nature outside of Christ can do no good. Now man can do good deeds. But his good deeds are filthy rights compared to the righteousness that God has. The good news is, is that God wants to give you his righteousness. He wants to bestow upon you the righteousness that is through Jesus Christ. And God will begin to work in your heart and your mind. Beginning to you to understand that you are a sinful person. By looking in yourself and seeing that you need a Savior, God will begin to work in your life so that you will have the faith to believe. All have turned aside. Uh, they are all together corrupt. No one does good, not even one. They won't even turn to serve God. They won't work towards God. If you do not believe in God, you will not seek after God and you will not serve God. But those who believe in Jesus Christ, those who love Jesus for all their hearts and their minds, those who are true believers, they have a desire to serve. If you are a Christian and you were watching this, you know in your heart and your mind that you have a desire to serve. You see, in Ephesians 4.11, Paul tells us that some were called to be apostles, some were called to be prophets, some were called to be evangelists. And some were called to be pastors and teachers. Everybody in this world will fall into one of those categories. You are called to teach someone about Jesus. You are called to serve. And when you love God with all your heart and with all your soul, and when you seek after Him, when you are in righteousness, you have a burning desire to minister and to worship and to serve a righteous God. 
Man in his deprived nature will not believe in God. He will not seek after God. He will not serve God. And that leads us to understand that man in his depravity will not call upon God. They have no knowledge. All the evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord. Now this will make sense. Those who do not believe in God will not seek after God, will not serve God, and will not call upon Him when needed most. They have no knowledge. Here David explains that those who do not believe in God, they have no knowledge. They don't seek after knowing who God is. When I became a believer in Jesus Christ, it wasn't that I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior and then I carried on the same path. That is not being a true believer. That is not being genuinely saved. There's too many people who want to walk the aisles, who want to say a few words and be saved, but they never make a commitment. That is not lordship salvation. That is you made easy believism. That is not what the gospel calls us to do. The gospel calls us to believe, to believe and to continue to believe. When we have a genuine conversion experience, not only do we have a head knowledge, but we have a heart knowledge, but then we want to serve. And when we do so, we call upon God. It's almost as if you would call us having a relationship with our Lord and Savior. That's what Christianity is. That's what separates this from every world religion that has ever existed. We do not have a religion. We have a relationship. Because it goes beyond just a head knowledge but transforms into a relationship to an all-powerful, loving God who loved us enough that He sent His Son to die for us. But those who do not know God, they will not call upon God. They will not call upon Him and, and have a communion with Him. They will not pray to God. They will not speak to God. They don't seek after Him. They have no knowledge. The evildoers, all the evildoers... They eat up my people here, David explains, uh, using the words as the Lord would say, that they, they choke out, they eat up, they have no desire for brothers and sisters, and they eat them up just like they eat bread, and they do not call upon the Lord. Too many times, too many times, when the unbeliever decides to, to turn and to call upon God, it's too late. It's too late. You can't make a decision after death. Uh, you've heard the tale of many times, dead men tell no tales. Dead men cannot repent. Dead men cannot make changes. When you die physically, if you have not made a life decision, there is no second chance. There is no turning back. There is no, I'm going to live my best life now, and I'm going to do what I want to do, and I'll have time to repent later. It doesn't work like that. Life is but a fleeting flash. Your life could end at any moment's notice. You could drop dead from a car accident. You could be dead from the coronavirus in 14 days. You don't get a second chance. As I have said before in my gospel messages, that the only thing certain in life is death. There won't be a second time. There won't be a time to call upon the Lord. It will be too late. Not only man in his depravity will not believe in God, he will not seek after God, therefore he will not serve God, therefore he will not call upon God, but he will then not fear God. Here David says, there they are in great terror, for God is with the generations of the righteous. You would shame the plans of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. Here, David says that they are in great terror. It's because they have no fear. Here, the believers, that is, the righteous ones, those who are uh, the righteous generation, they have a great fear. Uh, later on in the Psalms and even in the Proverbs, uh, Solomon writes that the fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. Uh, he, David says, well, you know, why, why are we, uh, so, af why are we uh, so afraid of God? Why are we not afraid? There is a great terror. For God is with the generations of the righteous. The righteous fear. But the unrighteous, they do not fear. 
They do not fear because they do not believe. And because they do not believe, they have no worry. Why worry about the flesh? Why worry about the physical enemy who can only destroy the body? The Bible tells us to fear God who can destroy the flesh and can destroy the soul. The unrighteous, the depraved man, he will not fear God. But by then it will be too late. You would shame the plans of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. When you fear God, he will protect you. He will love you and he will watch over you. But outside of Christ, outside of God, there should be a great terror. But the fool says in his heart that he does not believe in God. This leads us to our last point. Man in his depravity will not believe in God, therefore he will not seek after God. He will not serve God. He will not call upon God, and he will not fear God. But man in his depravity will not see God. Here David concludes Psalm 14 with verse 7. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, let Jacob rejoice, let Israel be glad. Here we see that those who are believers, all oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. And exactly that, Jesus Christ came out of Israel. Jesus being uh, the Savior for Israel, but being not only the Savior for Israel, not only the Savior for the Jewish people, but being the Savior of the world for Jew and Gentile. For all of those, the Lord will come out of Zion. And when the Lord restores the fortune of his people, Jacob will rejoice. Israel will be glad. Uh, the, here David speaks about the patriarchs and how they will pray to worship God because a Savior is coming. But those who do not believe, man in his depravity, he will not see God as his Savior. The unrighteous and eternal damnation. The greatest suffering that they will face will not be that they are in eternal hell, but will be eternally separated from a loving, righteous Father. That is the exact definition of hell. Now, I know what you're thinking. There are many of those who say, God is too loving, God is too merciful, God would never send somebody to hell then you've never read your Bible. Then you've never opened up the words. Then you've never comprehended that you are either in righteousness or you are not. Revelation talks about the great white throne judgment and the separation from the wheat and tares. The wheat being the edible, the being the profitable, being the children of God. The tares, those that is unedible, those who are unrighteous, they will be cast into a fire. They will be burned away like the chafe. They will experience eternal damnation. They will be separated by God. They will not see God as their Lord and Savior. They will be locked away in eternal torment because man, because sinful man does not believe in God. But oh, what a salvation. That will come out of Zion. That will restore the fortunes of his people. That will restore those here on earth. Those who are believers. Let Jacob rejoice. Let Israel be glad. That Jesus will save us from our depravity. In conclusion, I want you to understand this. That life. Without God, it's not worth living. That a life outside of the righteousness of God is not worth living. You may have a few moments of happiness and glory and, and honoring yourself here on earth. You may have what you call living your best life now. You may have uh, just a carefree attitude. But this life will come to an end. And when this life is over, 
you're going to be faced with, did you believe in God or did you not? Did you accept Jesus? Did, did Jesus open up your heart and mind? Did you call upon him to ask forgiveness of your sins? Or were you too busy doing something else? We're going to have an invitation right now. And if you are at home, or if you are wherever you are watching this message, and you do not believe in Jesus Christ, I ask you, I implore you, to stop and to cry out to God. Cry out with a voice. Cry out with someone who knows that they are lost and that they need a Savior. You may not understand what it means to be lost. You may not understand what it means to need a Savior. But I'm telling you now that there are two things that can happen. Either you will enter into the kingdom of heaven in the life after or you are entering eternal damnation. And I implore you, I beg you to cry out to God. Because God can save you. You cannot save yourself. Heavenly Father, I come to you in prayer. Praise your holy name. Father, forgive us for where we have sinned. Sinned again against a righteous God. Sinned against you and for where we have failed you. Forgive us for being deprived and sinful. Father God, my prayer for those who are listening now that they, if they have never made a profession of faith if they have not cried out to you that you would open up their hearts and their minds to let them see themselves in their deprived nature to see them in their lostness and that they are in need of an eternal savior and that this life is fleeting it's passing us by and I pray, Father, that you would move in the hearts and the minds of those who are believers, continuing to lead them on a path of righteousness in your will and in your honor and for your glory. Father, we praise your holy name. And it is in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.